Do you have trouble sleeping? If so, you're one of 60 million people who also suffer from this problem. Today on Naturally Savvy TV, we're talking about sleep disorders. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Donsky and you're watching Naturally Savvy TV, your guide for everything healthy living. Today I'm here with Dr. Zoltan Rona, a medical doctor who's been practicing medicine for 37 years. And if that's not enough, he also has a master's degree in biochemistry and clinical nutrition. Dr. Rona specializes in preventative medicine and natural therapies, which is exactly why we invited him to be on our show today. He's also a best-selling author three times over. Welcome to Naturally Savvy TV, Dr. Rona. Nice to be here. So I want to talk about sleep disorders because I know, as mm -hmm. we mentioned, is that it's a huge problem for people. Yes. What are some of the reasons people are having trouble sleeping these days? Well, it's multifactorial. I believe that there's quite a few different reasons. Uh, some of it may be that they're getting too many stimulants during the day. Uh, they may be uh, not getting enough exercise. Um, there may be uh, family or stress issues, right. relationship issues, um, other types of stresses, adrenal insufficiency, mm -hmm. hormonal imbalances, there's many different reasons. I've, I've heard that the, it's a tied into adrenals. Like if you wake yeah. up at 3 a.m. or 3 in the morning and you're wide awake, it's because mm -hmm. our cortisol is peaking. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes, uh, cortisol has to be at an optimal level. It's our uh, stress hormone. So okay. whenever we're under huge amounts of stress, the blood levels go too high and that okay. sort of puts us in a state of you know being too alert. Okay. And so if that happens at the wrong time of the day, then we're not gonna be able to get enough sleep. So what's causing it to peak at three in the morning versus when, when is it actually supposed to peak for us? Well, usually in the afternoon, mid afternoon okay. is when cortisol will peak. Um, and some people, uh, you know, it peaks a little bit too late or too early and they can't, they just don't get enough sleep because of that. So is there a way, so if somebody, if, I guess that's one of the warning signs that it could be an adrenal issue is that if they mm -hmm. are waking up at 3 a.m., what would be some strategies they can use to help counteract or lower their cortisol level at that time? Well, the most important thing is to control stress. Okay. So if you can do that, uh, there's many different ways of doing that. I find that a, a higher protein intake seems to help the adrenals, uh, you know, basically build up their reserves so that they don't respond at the wrong time. So having the protein before they go to sleep at night or just... Well, I, I think probably throughout the day if they could have small amounts of protein as okay. opposed to the carbs. The carbs are going to be the worst kind of thing because that's going to elevate their blood sugar and it's going to induce another cortisol response. So probably higher protein intakes would be the best as far as diet goes. Which makes a lot of sense because we know that carbs also, I mean, they play... They're not good for us in general, and we know that, especially yeah. if you're eating refined carbohydrates, so mm -hmm. it would make sense that something, you know, having something like a protein that helps to balance that blood sugar would help our adrenals. Right, and people consume a lot of carbs in order to get energy. Right. So they do get a spike in the blood sugar, right. and then they get a precipitous fall as well right. shortly afterwards. And so the cortisol comes in and tries to build it up again. So uh, really, to cut back on the carbs is probably a very good idea. It makes a lot of sense. So in terms of, you mentioned that it could be a genetic or something related to a genetic mm. factor that's causing issues for their sleep. What would be an example of that you know, genetic predisposition? Well, I think if somebody has in their family history uh, diabetes or hypoglycemia okay. or a lot of food allergies, that sort of thing would probably uh, contribute to them as well. So it would make them you know, not fall asleep? Yeah. They probably have also some issues with food. So either food intolerances or food addictions. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of people that have uh, psychological or psychiatric problems, mm -hmm. many times they're addicted to foods, common foods like uh, wheat or gluten and dairy products. Those are the commonest ones. And that basically affects the way they're sleeping or falling yeah, asleep? Yeah, it can. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Now, what about for menopausal women? I know that, you know, I, I do work with uh, Lorna Vanderhagen. I know that she mm -hmm. was saying that a lot of people can have issues when when they reach menopause. What are some of the yes. issues, what are some of the reasons why women are having trouble sleeping when they reach menopause? Well, the condition is called estrogen dominance. Okay. Uh, when you get into the menopause, what happens is that all your hormones go lower, but the estrogen doesn't seem to go as low as the progesterone does. So when progesterone hits the bottom, uh, that's when women seem to have problems with, with uh, sleeping. So I usually find that by uh, using various herbs, uh, you can improve the progesterone level, particularly Vitex mm -hmm. or Chaseberry. Right. Uh, and, and some women will actually need a progesterone prescription in order to sleep well. 
So that's the usual cause. It's an imbalance between the estrogen and progesterone favoring too much estrogen relative to the progesterone. Now what about somebody who has, you know, let's say insomnia? Mm -hmm. And I know there's probably different kinds. So let's say someone has trouble falling asleep. We talked about the person who wakes up at 3 a.m. But what about for somebody who's act who actually, they get into bed and then they're wide awake? What would that person, what could they do to help them fall asleep? And what would be some of the reasons that they would be having trouble falling asleep in the first place? Well, that might be uh, problems with what are called neurotransmitters. Okay. So there may be a problem with not enough uh, stimulation of the GABA receptors. Um, there may be a problem with serotonin, a lack of serotonin or an imbalance there. So usually uh, various uh, hormone um, adaptogens may help there. So something like f tryptophan or melatonin or maybe even GABA and theanine and the amino acid called theanine okay. may usually help uh, the brain make more GABA and so that quiets the brain down and allows you to hmm. fall asleep. But everybody's a little bit different. So some people respond to one and not the other one. And you had mentioned that getting too much stimulation. So for example, if, some, if you're somebody that has trouble falling asleep, then you shouldn't be exercising at night, for example, right? Exactly. And okay. the other issue is caffeine. Mm, good one. So right. if you're overdoing caffeine, there are some people that do not clear caffeine out of their system you know, within a few hours. They take sometimes 24 or 48 hours to really clear the caffeine. They're very caffeine sensitive. Okay. Often these people are also addicted to caffeine. Right. So there's, a, there's an issue there. You know, yeah. and I know I'm, I'm someone who doesn't metabolize caffeine very yeah. well, and I could tell. So I would be the type of person that, well, I stay away from caffeine in general, mm -hmm. but that would be someone, if they feel that their body's not responding well to it, definitely stay away from it. Oh, yeah. You know, after, let's say, was it noon or three o'clock? I would stay away from it after noon. After noon, yeah. really? Okay, so that's good advice. And um, now people, let's say someone, I know waking up in the middle of the night to go to the washroom, I know that's mm -hmm. a big problem. I hear that from a lot of people. And I know that, is that a sign of a weak bladder? I mean, obviously that contributes to a lack of sleep, but what could be some of the reasons for that? Well, in women, it tends to be a problem with a weak bladder. Okay. And you know, you, you can actually do some pelvic exercises, they're called Kegel exercises, okay. to strengthen the bladder. You can also take Angelica and other herbs to help with urination. In men, it's all, almost always a, an enlarged prostate. Mm, so okay, that's uh, a good tip. there are various, natural remedies for that. For example, salt palmetto is one, uh, zinc is another, uh, flax, uh, milled flax is another. So hmm. there are different things that you can take. That's a very good point actually in terms of um, I think the difference between women and men because mm -hmm. sometimes we think it's a one issue across the board when it right. actually it's different reasons. Uh, it could be different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, wow, that's very interesting. Now what about in terms of Meditation. I know obviously meditation is really great for us. Would that help people sleep better? Uh, I guess it's more about relaxing yeah. themselves, right? Taking a bath, smelling some right. lavender, or like what about some tips like yeah. that? Yeah, to induce relaxation, you can use something like meditation, acupuncture. There's also a technique called EFT, emotional mm. freedom Love technique. EFT. Yeah, so pe people yeah. can learn that very easily. Uh, you can go on the um, go on the internet and you can get the EFT manual for free off the internet and yeah. practice practice that and that really does help with relaxation the other thing is very important uh, for both men and women is magnesium mm, that's and a great point. magnesium deficiency is very common and probably one of the biggest causes of insomnia is a lack of magnesium so uh, you can get magnesium in a pill you can get it intravenously you could rub it on your skin and it'll absorb into your really? system. So there's many ways of getting magnesium, but I, that would be one of the first remedies I would recommend to anybody. You know, I want, to I want to stay on magnesium and talk about it for a minute because I actually love magnesium and I know yeah. it's responsible for hundreds of functions in our body. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, one of the, th like my daughters, I have two daughters, three kids, but two daughters, and both of them tell me that they feel funny, their legs feel funny. So I'm thinking restless legs. Yes. Now, I know that magnesium is great for that. So. Let's talk about magnesium for a minute because mm -hmm. it's great for adults, it's great for kids. Let's talk about dosage and just to kind of delve into it. Okay, uh, the best form that you can take magnesium orally is called the bisglycinate form. Okay. That's basically magnesium complex with L-glycine. Okay. And the reason why that's the best is because that seems to absorb well and not cause diarrhea. Right. Now, if you take magnesium citrate, magnesium oxide, other forms of magnesium, you'll get like very loose bowel movements mm -hmm. before the magnesium can get into your system right. and give you the antispasmodic or relaxation effect. Because that's what mag magnesium yeah. does, right? It's a muscle relaxant. It's an right? antispasmodic. And if you mention muscle spasm, you mention pain, you mention irritability, nervousness, you think magnesium. 
I, I get yeah. twitches in my eye. I could That's, tell if I'm deficient in magnesium because yeah. my, my right eye starts to twitch. Yeah. So then I know to take more magnesium and it goes away. So that would be an example. Uh, another uh, magnesium deficiency sign is a craving for chocolate. Ah, oh uh, no. For some really reason, deficient. <laughs> so instead of going for the chocolate, go for some magnesium. Right. Can you explain that a little bit? We wrote about that in Unjunk or Junk Food, a little yeah, bit, the tie to magnesium and chocolate, but I'd love you to explain that a little bit, why Yeah, because chocolate. that's part of, part of chocolate. So some, some people, they feel that they're getting their magnesium hit by, by getting chocolate. Other people get it through green juices, because mm -hmm. magnesium is a central element of chlorophyll. So whatever's green contains magnesium. So from the diet, uh, you know, things like kale and spinach and broccoli and parsley and so on, all of those are good sources of magnesium. And can we get enough magnesium from our diet for the average person? The average person can if they remember to consume greens throughout the day. But how many people do that? Right. So very few. So taking you know. a supplement is a good option. Yeah. A supplement is a good option. Reducing caffeine because the more caffeine you consume, the more magnesium you, you lose. Oh, okay. uh, which brings me to another point is that if you're on medications, particularly water pills or other medications, uh, you can actually deplete magnesium from your system. And so can stress. Yeah, stress will also deplete magnesium. Your heart requires huge amounts of magnesium just to keep keep going. So if you've got a rapid heart rate or if you've got an, uh, some kind of uh, arrhythmia, mm -hmm. these are all signs that you probably need more magnesium. So if somebody chooses to supplement with magnesium, mm -hmm. what would be the proper dosage, for example, for a woman, for a man, and for a child? Okay, for... Um, for most people, for, for adults, uh, I believe the RDA is somewhere around 400 milligrams a day. Okay. Now, it all depends on the individual. Like for children, it would be less. But um, for men and women, what I recommend they do is they start with, you know, 1,000 milligrams. If, if I see a clear sign of a magnesium deficiency, magnesium bisglycinate about 1,000 milligrams a day in divided doses. Okay. Uh, if they have an insomnia problem, usually take most of that at night. Now, if the next day they wake up and they have diarrhea, cut back on the right, dose. If they don't have diarrhea and they're not sleeping, increase the dose. Okay. So you could play around with it like that. Now, if you're using magnesium citrate, uh, that is mostly for moving the bowels. And there's an issue with that because if you get diarrhea on a regular basis from too much magnesium, you can actually make the magnesium deficiency worse. Oh, okay. That's called magnesium-induced magnesium deficiency. Okay, so, magnesium-induced magnesium deficiency. Or something like that. <laughs> but basically the right. idea is that you don't want to get too much right. so that you have, you're running to the bathroom all the time. Right. But for a lot of people, uh, you know, having a change in bowel movements such that they're getting bowel movements more frequently is a benefit. Because a lot of people are constipated. I have more people coming in my office with constipation than I can count. Really? It's just, it's just the number one problem. It seems, oh, I'm constipated. So you know, giving the magnesium really helps them. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've had people come in to see me who for years have had like one or two bowel movements a week. Oh, my gosh. Some of them even 10 days. And wow. they go to their doctors and doctors say, well, that's normal for you. That's very abnormal. Right. Okay. So for those people, magnesium is a real blessing. You know, and it makes a huge difference. And it just helps them go lives. regularly. Yeah. So just for the record, once we're on the topic of bowel movements, how many bowel movements should we be having a day? We should have one bowel movement per meal per day. Per day. That's optimal. Yeah, that is optimal. Okay. Um, naturopaths will always say that, and I agree with them. Right. Okay. So now just to go back to the magnesium supplement for a minute, should we be taking it? So if you're taking it, you know, once or twice a day, should you be taking it with food or on an empty stomach? You know what? Magnesium is actually very good for heartburn. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can take it on an empty stomach. You can take it with food. I think you can get a, the best benefit if you take it on an empty stomach. But okay. it doesn't really matter as long as you get it into you. As long as you get yeah. it into you. And then how long does it take? So, for example, you know, I started to give it to my daughters. How long does it take for it to take effect? So, let's say, for example, with restless legs. Mm -hmm. Well, usually it will work the first night that you use it if you okay. get the dose right. Right, okay. If the dose is too low, it may not work until you boost it up high enough. So, and, and even for me, I know that when my eye is twitching and I take it, it the next day it's gone. Yeah, so. it's usually, you know, within minutes to hours. Now, let's talk a little bit about, you know, just on the subject and then we'll, we'll move on, but magnesium to calcium. Should, I know that, you know, we talk a lot mm -hmm. about taking a calcium supplement with magnesium, with a ratio, a specific ratio. If we're taking the magnesium, is this on its own or is this together with a calcium pill? Okay, something? if you're taking calcium and not taking magnesium, you're making a big mistake because okay. the calcium will end up being deposited in places you don't want, like your arteries or your joints. Right. So if you're going to take calcium, you must take magnesium with it in an equal amount. Some people say twice as much. Okay. 
Um, two to one ratio. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, you know, people with osteoporosis, it's probably a good idea to take the two together. But people with osteoporosis need other things beside the calcium magnesium. Okay. So to be safe, one to one ratio. One to one ratio. Yeah. Now let's go on to the side effects of not having enough sleep. Because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, I know if I don't get enough sleep, especially for moms, you know, we talked about menopause, but also for moms like myself, our kids are waking us up constantly mm -hmm. in the middle of the night. If you have younger kids or there's, you know, let alone all the other reasons that you're getting woken up. But I know myself, I don't always get a good night's sleep because my daughter will wake me up at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. Right. or 6 a.m. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the side effects that people feel by not getting enough sleep. Well, first of all, it'll affect your energy level the next day. Uh, in many cases, it can affect weight control. So people who can't lose weight, why is that? Well, sometimes they're just not getting refreshing enough sleep. Mm -hmm. There's a whole class of conditions to deal with uh, that deal with muscle pain. There's a condition called fibromyalgia. There are other muscle or chronic pain conditions, migraine headaches. The list is almost endless with the number of things that can happen to you if you don't get enough sleep. I almost wonder if it's the chicken or the egg because you mentioned fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. but I know people with fibromyalgia are in a lot of pain and is that right. causing the lack of sleep? So I wonder sometimes what There's, comes first, There right? is a chicken and egg thing, but right. the, the truth is that once you get people sleeping well, not with drugs or with all kinds of chemicals, but right. sleeping well naturally, uh, you know, their muscle issues, their joint issues, uh, energy issues, all of those get better. Hmm. And I know I like that you brought up or that you mentioned the connection to weight because if we are tired, then we're reaching for food that's sugary that will help to boost our energy levels yep. and then that kind of, it's a vicious cycle. Well, statistically speaking, people that are overweight are just not getting enough sleep, mm -hmm. you know. Um, some of that may also be due to a lack of exercise, sedentary behavior, that kind of thing. What about someone who has early hours, like they go to work at, let's say, 2 or 3 a.m. and they're having trouble losing weight and they really can't get more than, let's say, four hours of sleep a night. In that case, what would help them take off some of that weight? Quit their job and get a, get a better job. <laughs> Besides I, that, of course. I, no, I'm serious. <laughs> really? I've had nothing but trouble with uh, people really? that have these uh, sort of upside down days where they're working at night and sleeping during the day. Mm -hmm. um, you need darkness to, fall, to sleep. Mm -hmm. And if you have even a little bit of light in your room, it's very hard to fall asleep. It's like, it's funny, the body works that way, that we require complete darkness to sleep well. And I love that you mentioned that. I remember reading years ago on Dr. Mercola's website, talking mm -hmm. about melatonin, darkness, melatonin, and yes. the connection to breast cancer. Exactly. So uh, let's just for, you know, talk about that really quickly, because you mentioned the fact that we do need darkness to sleep. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, they might not have that complete dark, darkness no, in their room, no. right? They've got an electric clock, or they've got some nightlight. Whatever it is, right. it's, it's inhibiting the release of melatonin. And that, in the, when, so explain what melatonin is and why it's so crucial. Well, melatonin is uh, basically a hormone made in the pineal, and it uh, controls our ability to sleep, to be awake. Uh, um, it also controls our immune system to a large degree. So, you, you know, there are books written about all the benefits of melatonin. And one of the things that it does is it prevents certain types of hormonally related cancers, particularly breast cancer, mm -hmm. uh, uterine, ovarian cancer. Uh, in men, prostate cancer. So it's a very important hormone. For that, we need mm -hmm. some of it, you know. After age 35, we secrete less and less. Okay. So uh, if, we, if we continue to have uh, light in our rooms, we're not gonna secrete any. So that's why it's good to take a supplement of it. And I know it's pretty safe. It's a safe hormone to supplement Very safe, with. Yeah, yeah. it's very safe. I know they did some studies at the Children's Hospital in Vancouver and they took mm. large doses and they were completely, it was completely safe. Right. So what about, so people, what about, what about for jet lag? So I know when I travel going from the West Coast to the East Coast, it's really mm. hard on me from yeah. a sleep perspective. What is, should we be using melatonin to help ease that jet lag or what are some strategies? I think you should. I think you should take melatonin as soon as you arrive at the destination and okay. take it until you get back. Um, it's been proven to help with jet lag symptoms. So just what, like three milligrams, five milligrams, 10 milligrams? What Usually would be three milligrams would work for most would people. Would be enough? Yeah. Okay. Well, Some people good. need more, but you know, most will uh, do well with three milligrams. So that's great advice if you travel a lot. I know I travel, so that's, that's really good to know for me. Yeah and to help me get over some of that, and all of us to get over some of that jet lag. Yeah. Let's talk a bit, you mentioned before about you know, not really taking drugs. And I think for a mm -hmm. lot of people, when you're really, you're not sleeping and you're craving that sleep, you might say, oh, let me take a half a sleeping pill or let me take a sleeping pill to really help me get a good night's sleep because obviously mm -hmm. you're not functioning properly. And we know right. sleep is the most important thing. So right. we need to be getting our sleep. 
what do you recommend to people who are you know taking those medications and should they should they is it safe should they stop what what's your opinion on that my big problem with all those medications is the uh, fact that a lot of people they get addicted to those things mm -hmm. and the addiction may be very subtle doctors will tell you no these are not addictive they're not habit forming or whatever you want to call it but in actual fact trying to get people off of those things who have been on them for like several months is really difficult hmm. um, so I usually recommend total lifestyle revision I mean get into exercise get into better eating habits do all of those things while you're taking the pill and gradually try to reduce it but those things are benzodiazepines for the most part and that's a class of drugs that's that's addictive and does it, what kind of side effects do those drugs have? Well, some of them actually cause insomnia. Some of them cause depression. Uh, I mean, think about it. You're basically suppressing or, you know, basically downing the uh, nervous system. So some people feel depressed. It, it's very much the same as hmm. you do with alcohol. Alcohol and benzodiazepines, I, you know, I'm hard-pressed to see which one is more dangerous. Wow. You know, because they're both addictive. So if somebody wanted to, let's say, they wanted to wean off a sleeping pill, whether mm -hmm. they're taking one or a half or whatever it is a day, mm -hmm. what could they do and what could they supplement supplement with if they need that extra boost? If, let's say they're just you know, changing your eating habits, exercising, it's not, they need something a little bit more. They could take some GABA, which is GABA or gamma amino butyric acid, and they could take some theanine. Okay. Uh, that's another amino acid. Uh, they could start taking that in fairly uh, increasing doses while they're taking the sleeping pill and gradually cut back on the sleeping pill. And those are totally safe? As far as I know, they're very safe. They're available in health food stores. Uh, mm -hmm. I've never seen anybody addicted to those things. Right. But you know, you have to take all this in context with a you know, diet and lifestyle revision. Which I think is the key for everybody, yeah. right? Is really kind of changing several different factors in your life that help right. to contribute to having that better night's mm -hmm. sleep. That's right. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our viewers before we end the interview today? Sure. Um, for some women uh, who are using progesterone or using Vitex or herbs and not getting the benefits in terms of their sleep, um, I sometimes recommend Prometrium, which is an oral progesterone mm -hmm. coming from a natural source, which is given in uh, women who can't sleep with the creams and with the other natural remedies because it goes through the liver and because of that it it tends to uh, produce a sort of a sedative effect. Uh, it doesn't knock you out or anything, but it, it does help women sleep a lot better. And it's safe to use if women are already doing taking bioidentical yes. or doing bioidentical hormones, they can do right. this on top of that. That's right. It actually will help prevent breast cancer and other female cancers. And what's the dosage they should be, if they're going to ask, they need to get it, it's a prescription, It's right? a prescription, so you'll need to get it from your uh, family doctor. It's about 100 milligrams before bedtime. And sometimes some women have to go up to 200 milligrams. But they should see a difference in terms of helping yeah. them sleep, and instead of using the sleeping pill. Exactly. It'll, it'll work almost right away. Thank you, Dr. Ona. It was really a pleasure having you here today, and I really appreciate you coming in and sharing your knowledge with us. My pleasure. If you learned something from today's show, please like this video and share it with your friends. And be sure to subscribe to our channel because we have many more videos coming your way every single week. If you have comments or questions about what we talked about today, be sure to leave them below. If you want to learn more from Dr. Rona, you can visit his website at highlevelwellness.ca. Thanks for hanging out with us today, and I'll see you next time on Naturally Savvy TV when we talk to Erin Elizabeth from Health Nut News. Be well.